us look at uh, models in satisfiability and validity for uh, briefly. Uh, so, we looked at the notion of satisfiability, we are actually taken that uh, no notion from uh, propositional logic and generalized it. The notion of a model uh, and, uh, and therefore, from this notion of model comes the notion of satisfiability also. Uh, basically, uh, as a formula or a set of formula is satisfiable if and only if there is a model which satisfies uh, the formula or the set of formulae. Yeah, then uh, as simple examples and then we had this notion of logical consequence, uh, which again is taken uh, we, uh, ex ex generalized from uh, propositional logic and then we had this notion of uh, validity, which is essentially a generalization of the notion of a tautology in propositional logic and uh, logical equivalence, which is essentially a form of validity. So, you have uh, the usual negations of semantical concepts and, uh, and then let us look at the, so our first order logic is of course, parameterized on uh, uh, a signature. So, there is the question of what happens when you have different kinds of signatures and, and some relationships between them and that is what we will look at today. Yeah. So, we will look at structures and substructures and we will also look at expansions and redux. Um, briefly. Okay. So, so, since the we are parameterized on a specific thing, signature, uh, we have to look at, uh, so uh, supposing you have a sub signature basically. So, sigma 1 is a sub signature of sigma 2, which just means that sigma 2 has all the, uh, all the elements of the signature sigma 1 and uh, we are looking at satisfiability. Uh, so, for any set of formulae phi, uh, if it is satisfiable with respect to uh, sigma 1, the smaller signature, then phi is also satisfiable with respect to sigma 2. Basically, what you are saying is that if it is satisfiable with respect to sigma 1, then the terms in the formula do not have any uh, symbol which occurs in sigma 2, but not in sigma 1. So, so satisfiability just gets carried over. So, the notion of satisfiability therefore, is monotonic with respect to the notion of a sub signature. Yeah, so, basically what you are saying is that, uh, so in, in the, you are es essentially saying that the, the symbols that are common to s in the two signatures, they will have the same interpretation. Uh, as far as satisfiability of phi is concerned and uh, in, in both the in both the structures. yeah, And for all other symbols, so symbols which are in sigma 2, but not in sigma 1, you can actually give them any interpretation you like uh, and, uh, and you can give some arbitrary uh, interpretations and uh, it will still follow. So, so that is, uh, so this is intuitively obvious, so I will not go through it, but otherwise uh, there is an exercise. Uh, in which, uh, in which you, you have to formally prove this using the semantics. Yeah. So, which I leave it to you as homework to do. Uh, okay, since you're not doing enough homework, uh, so, so there is this notion of distinguishability also. So, what we can we can talk about a formula or a set of formulae distinguishing between two structures. Uh, remember that uh, we should always keep in mind the fact that uh, these uh, signatures and the structures we are talking about can be quite abstract and therefore, the only way of talking about them may be through a formal logical language uh, like first order logic. Uh, so, essentially you are looking at the first order theory of those. Right. So, we can talk about uh, distinguishability also uh, using the formal language of first order logic to distinguish between different structures. Uh, essentially the problem, so distinguishability is uh, has to do with the distinguishability from uh, in the in the sense of uh, properties. Yeah. So, so, uh, so we will see that, uh, okay, we will we'll come to that later. So, if you look at uh, these two structures which have the same signature namely uh, 
well take the integers without any operations so we look at distinguishability of structures in terms of properties that they satisfy and uh, so uh, if you take these two structures uh, integers without any operations and with just the equality and the less than so the density property for example so, we have a less than relation and the density property essentially says that between any two rational numbers uh, there exists a rational number and this density property for example is not obeyed by the integers I mean given any two consecutive in integers there is no integer between them. Okay, so, you we can think of this property as essentially distinguishing these two structures. So, it is satisfied by one structure, but not satisfied by the other. Okay. So, there is uh, so, we will so, we will look at, uh, so of course, we require some small change in notation uh, to look at evaluations under different structures. So, if you are evaluating terms or your tr uh, truth of formulae under different structures, we will subscript our valuations and our uh, truth functions and so on and so forth by the appropriate structure name. Yeah. Okay, so, this is, uh, so this is one thing and now essentially we are uh, ready to uh, look at relationships between different structures and notions. So, we have already seen distinguishability. Uh, it is quite possible that two structures are isomorphic. So, one thing is if you look at uh, the naturals uh, under the successor operation equality and less than, uh, it is actually isomorphic to the set of even numbers under a successor operation which is which essentially adds to to each number and uh, with equality and less than. So, these two structures are isomorphic uh, because uh, there exists a one to one correspondence uh, n goes to 2 n between this this carrier set and this carrier set and it preserves these corresponding operations. right? Okay, so, these two structures are isomorphic. So, in that sense uh, as far as the signature is concerned, yeah, if you look at these two structures as being essentially uh, uh, s structures uh, with this common signature, uh, then what happens is that uh, you take any formula in with this with this signature. Uh, if it is satisfied by one, it will be satisfied by the other. Okay. So, the first the first limitation that we come across in the formalization of uh, mathematical theories is that a first order formalization of a mathematical theory uh, will not be able to distinguish between isomorphic, but distinct structures. So, if the two structures are isomorphic there is you actually no first order logic formula which will distinguish them and that is something we will prove we will we'll prove next uh, and that is uh, very easy. So, this is called the isomorphism lemma. So, if a and b are isomorphic sigma structures for the same signature sigma then for all formulae phi uh, a, a satisfies phi if and only if b satisfies phi. Yeah. So, assume that there is an uh, there is a one to one correspondence between their carrier sets uh, which also preserves the operations uh, and the relations uh, over this uh, over this function phi uh, over this function pi. Note that in the case of isomorphisms, um, if there is a pi from the carrier set of A to the carrier set of B, then there is a pi inverse also a function, which is also a one to one correspondence from the carrier set of B to carrier set of A. And further pi composed with pi inverse gives you the identity on one set, pi inverse composed with pi gives you the identity on the other set. So, so, so all these properties are satisfied by a typical isomorphism. right? Now, all that we are saying is firstly the first thing to realize is that uh, so, so we will just so assume there is an isomorphism the, there, there is also an inverse which uh, there is also an inverse uh, function. Uh, pi inverse which is 1 to 1 and on to and uh, of course, these properties are all satisfied. So, you take uh, any term 
uh, in the structure A and apply pi to it, you get a corresponding term where pi uh, works inside the uh, corresponding function f b. right? So, you take the images of these uh, arguments a 1 to a m which are pi a 1 to pi a m and this equality would be would hold between the structures. And similarly, if you take any uh, term uh, in the in the structure b through pi inverse you can actually get a corresponding term uh, in the structure a. And uh, the same also holds for this relations p a and p b. Okay. And then what you can prove is this stronger claim and, and the other thing to realize is that in all these cases whether you are considering valuations, oh I am sorry this, uh, oh yeah, whether you are considering valuations of terms or truth values of uh, formulae, the only uh, variables that are important are the variables that occur free in the formulae or in the terms. right? Uh, so, so, for every formula phi, so you for every valuation V a, uh, there exists a corresponding valuation pi composed with V a and for every valuation V b, there is a corresponding uh, valuation pi inverse composed with V b. And uh, what you can show by induction on the structure of formulae is that uh, the truth value of phi in the structure a under any valuation V a is equal to the truth value of phi in B under the valuation pi, pi composed with V a which is a valuation in B. right? And uh, similarly uh, for the, in the inverse case, so for any valuation V b uh, in the structure B, the truth value of phi under that valuation is exactly the truth value of phi under pi inverse applied to V b which gives you a valuation in V a uh, and, uh, and it is easy to show this. So, you can prove this by induction on the structure of the formula phi and um, it is left as an exercise. Uh, 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 remember that in the process of uh, evaluating these, you will also have to use uh, at some point the valuation functions V a and V b. But the interest, but the important thing is that your pi and pi inverse also carry through to the language of terms. So, in fact, uh, what happens uh, is uh, you have this. Um, uh, so, so as a result, so uh, so you can actually prove that uh, you'll have to first prove that V a for any term t under the valuation V a equals V b of the same term t under the valuation uh, pi composed with V a and vice versa, right? So that that is uh, that is something that will be important. Uh, so, uh, a corollary of this is that uh, essentially that for any formula phi with free variables x 1 to x n, I do not need to necessarily consider valuations separately. I need to I can consider any kind of valuation provided pi respects the valuations of the free variables. Yeah. So, so, in fact as a as a corollary, so the only things that are actually important are the free variables that occur in the formula phi. And so, you take any valuation V a uh, you and you take any valuation V b, V a may not pi composed with V a may not be equal to pi composed with V b. However, you take the valuation V a uh, for every for the variables x 1 to x n, if you preserve uh, the in the valuation V b the values pi of a 1 to pi of a n, it is sufficient. And in fact, you can show that this interpretation is a model of phi if and only if this interpretation is a model of phi for all V a and V b. Yeah. So, uh, that basically shows that all uh, the valuation function for all function uh, for all variables which are outside the free variable set of this formula phi is actually unimportant and does not matter. Right. So, it is just that they should the isomorphism should be preserved 
for that subset of free variables which actually occurs in the formula. Right? Uh, okay. So, which means now this this now this is true for every formula of phi, which means for any set of formulae capital phi, the structure A is a model of capital phi if and only if the, stru if the structure B is a model of capital phi. Okay. So, and this is true for any set of formulae phi uh, capital phi and therefore, it means that using just first order formulae one cannot distinguish isomorphic structures. Right? The way one could distinguish uh, using the density formula one could distinguish between uh, the rationals and the integers for example, uh, you cannot do the same thing for isomorphic structures. Yeah? Right. But what this raises is another important question and this is a question that has uh, uh, that was quite uh, that is quite important and it, we should answer it at some point. Supposing I have two sigma structures which satis which are satis which satisfy the same formulae, then are they necessarily isomorphic? So, this is a question that puzzled a lot of logicians actually uh, in, in the initial years when uh, first order logic was formalized uh, uh, through various means. So, uh, the answer actually lies in what are known as non-standard models uh, which we will come to later. Yeah, But uh, what it means is that the converse of the converse of the isomorphism lemma does not necessarily hold. Right, and that is an important thing. So, we will look at that at some point. Right. Okay. Then uh, we might look at uh, structures which are somehow related uh, through a substructure relation. Um, so, we will say that a, a structure A is a substructure of another st uh, st structure B, uh, where both of them have the same signature uh, provided. Uh, so, uh, the Previously, what we considered was subsignatures. Now we are considering substructures with the same signature. Okay, uh, so uh, so and so a typical example is of course the even numbers and the natural numbers, right? So the even numbers are a substructure of the naturals with the same signature in the example that we did. Okay, so what we are saying is so now if the uh, so, we will use the for the substructure we will use just use the subset notation because essentially what we are uh, what we are saying is that the domains uh, are related by the subset relation. So, the domain of the substructure uh, the structure A is a subset of the domain of the structure B. So, or rather the carrier set of this structure A is a subset of the carrier, uh, carrier set of the structure B. Uh, but of course, one has to uh, the, the notion of a substructure uh, requires something more. I mean there might be uh, you might you, you cannot choose an arbitrary subset uh, because uh, the functions in your signature uh, may not be closed uh, on the substructure. They might be closed on the structure B, but they may not be closed on the structure A. For example, uh, it is possible that there is a function f which takes values a 1 to a n from a, but the result of applying this function on this might be some value which is in b minus a. Right? So, so, there is so when it comes to a, the notion of a substructure it the uh, it is not just enough uh, for them to uh, for the domains to be related by the subset relation, it is also important that they be sigma closed. So, what this means is you do not really care much about what happens in the case of B, but in the case of A which is a, which is suppo uh, uh, the set A the domain of A for every function f for every MRE function f the corresponding function in the structure A should be a restricted version of the function f B. So, what you are saying is that essentially what you are saying is that 
f b supposing you restrict f b the domain of f b to just all the elements in the set a then f a should not be undefined for any tuple firstly and it should be closed under a so you just take so f b restricted to this is f a so what you are saying is so it has to be sigma closed in the sense that for each f f should be completely closed on a there should be no undefinedness by restricting your domain to a right and uh, the say in the case of the relation uh, in the case of the relations p actually the uh, the notion can be weaker all that we are saying is you take those for any nary relation you take only those n tuples uh, which are subsets of n tuples in a right so that is the so you have this restriction so you do if you do the restriction uh, your uh, substructure should still be sigma closed and if it is sigma closed then uh, you have uh, uh, you say that a is a substructure of b right so in this case it's important to realize for example if you instead of the even numbers uh, if you were to take the odd numbers with just equality and less than or some such thing. Uh, you can have a, a successor function which again adds 2, but the moment you take this signature to include an identity element like 0 for addition or if you even if you include the operation of addition in your signature, then what happens is your odd numbers under addition are not a substructure of the naturals. On the other hand, your even numbers still remain a substructure of the natural. Okay? I mean you can, you can try some other kinds of uh, things. Uh, uh, so, so, we are using the fact that the sum of two odd numbers is an even number. Right? Um, however, the product of two odd numbers is an odd number. So, supposing you take the structure naturals with multiplication, uh, then the odd numbers uh, do they form a substructure under multiplication of the of the naturals? I mean that is that is the question that you can ask. they form a substructure? No, there is a problem there especially with 0. Okay. The, they will not form exact substructures because of the presence of 0 in the naturals whereas there is no 0 in the uh, odd numbers. No, then that is a hack which we will have to work out before we take any specific judgments, but if I have to guess I would guess that there would still be a problem. Uh, yeah. So, so what I am saying is odd numbers do not I mean unless you can prove it odd numbers including 0 uh, under multiplication unless you can prove that this is actually a substructure by making it by uh, and showing that it is sigma closed uh, it is not clear. No, 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 no. That might be okay for CBSE mathematics. It's not okay for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is a distinguished element. Uh, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it is it's a constant. So, actually uh, what happens is supposing you uh, 
you think of the natural numbers as being generated, let us say through the through a successor operation. Okay? So, you can think of it as a simple elementary language which generates. So, any generation process would require a seed, a basis of the induction and, the, and that basis of the induction would form the distinguished element. Okay? So, what you are saying is that the naturals can be generated by the successor operation uh, starting with 0. Okay. Um, the odd numbers would have to have a distinguished element like 1. If you have, if you just took your, if you restricted yourself to the odd numbers, you can think of the odd numbers as being generated by a successor operation which gives, which adds 2, but starting from 1. 0 and 1 can both be distinguished elements, but it depends on what is your focus. I mean your signature essentially gives you the focus, right. Okay. So, that is, so, that, uh, so, so, so what you, ch and, there, and there is another, there is another uh, way of, uh, there is another thing also. You take uh, something that we did yesterday was this uh, notion of a right inverse, right. So, what did we have? We had that, uh, we had an universal existential formula, right, which was, uh, let us, let us go back to that. Yeah, look at this formula phi 3, right. So, this is actually an extremely weak formula, oh no, not this, I am sorry. F uh, yeah, look at this formula phi right inverse, yeah, yeah. So, this is an extremely weak formula. Okay. Uh, that is, if your focus is on groups, okay. if you are talking about group theory and the group axioms, then uh, this is a very weak formula. On the other hand, this phi identity is not a weak formula, because um, I mean the, the question of 0 being also the left identity is provable in the theory of groups. Okay. So, that distinguished element 0, if it is a right identity, it is also a left identity that is provable and therefore, this identity axiom is not a weak axiom. On the other hand, the right inverse axiom, even though we can prove that the, the right inverse is also the left inverse, it is still a weak axiom because of the fact that in the case of groups, your inverse is supposed to be is unique. So, neither, so even, so, so uh, the phi left inverse is provable from phi right inverse, but the question of uniqueness of an inverse of an, of x is not, uh, is not immediately prove, I mean is not immediately captured by the axioms. Okay. So, in fact, uh, what happens is as a result, if you were really looking at group theoretic axioms, then you would have to strengthen this to a formula like this. Firstly, you will have to include in the signature an inverse function and secondly, you will have to strengthen this formula as for all x, x plus x inverse equals 0 it would have to become a universal formula. The possibility uh, on, and so which means what you are saying is that I had an original signature we did not have this inverse and now I am going to actually require this, uh, this, inver uh, this inverse also and only then I have essentially a group. Okay. So, strictly speaking our mathematics books which just uh, say that the inverse uh, is actually a derived function. Uh, from um, the product operation of the group uh, are not being strictly correct from a first order viewpoint because they are not ensuring uh, the expressibility. This is, a, this is a matter of expressiveness in the language, right. So, the expressiveness of group theoretic properties cannot be done by these weak formulae. It has to be done by a strong formula like this 
and so which means actually you should restrict your product operation and identity element just for monoids and for groups you should actually include the inverse operation also if you want in the signature okay that so those are some things we'll see uh, uh, at uh, this is like a sort of preview but so the 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 distinguish the the existence of a distinguished element as a constant is often important because in this case without that distinguished element you do not know the existence of an identity group right it's part of the axiom so you have to have it in the signature and similarly to express all group theoretic properties in first order logic all first order actually let's put it this way all first order group theoretic properties in first order logic in the first order first order theory of groups you require to also postulate the existence of an inverse operation it's not enough to just postulate the existence of an element for each element yeah which acts as an inverse uh, we'll we'll come to those mat i mean if if we have time we'll look at the notion of expressibility but uh, uh, but th 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 those are certain important things in any logic i mean uh, many many properties uh, think of it this way uh, the um, the number of different valid formulae uh, uh, the the number of different properties uh, could actually be countably infinite whereas the number of different formulae you have uh, in a language uh, which is which has a generation mechanism uh, is only countably infinite so it's clear that in any first order theory you will not exhaust all the properties that are you will not even be able to express all the properties that uh, that possibly exist for some mathematical theory you will require higher order logics but even in higher order logics you will always remain the moment it's a formal language you will remain within the domain of accountability so if there are an in uncountable number of properties which is quite likely uh, uh, there are uncountable there, there will be therefore be an uncountable number of properties which will not be expressible in the language yeah so that there are notions of expressiveness which are important so the, so there are obvious limitations imposed by countability yeah um, okay so let's uh, that that was a digression which we should uh, and we should go back to the notion of substructures yeah right uh, so we had isomorphic structures and uh, we have this notion of substructures and uh, so here we have the obvious examples on substructures which i have already said the even numbers are uh, under these operations are substructures of the uh, naturals the odd numbers may not be they are not closed under addition so they do not form a substructure of the naturals um, let us look at the notion of a quantifier free formula right so what happens in uh, all uh, if you look at the axioms that we have seen so far for let us say the group axioms is that uh, the formulae all had a certain structure in which you had a sequence of quantifiers and then a body of the formula which was essentially quantifier free okay which was free from quantifiers uh, of course our first order language does not put that restriction all formulae are not likely to be there you can have connectives propositional connectives mixed up with quantifiers and you can have other quantifiers inside you can have other proposition in arbitrary ways so we can think of since there is there are a sufficient number of axioms in fact most of the algebraic systems that we are talking about will actually have the structure of a sequence of quantifiers followed by a body which is quantifier free so we can talk about a quanti uh, the sub sub language of quantifier free formulae uh, as one which is just made up of the atomic formulae and uh, the propositional connectives so this essentially forms let's say the body of such formulae right so this this formula for example is uh, assuming that uh, equality is some atomic predicate um, this formula is uh, is a quantifier followed by a quantifier free formula so it has a body which is quantifier right so so for quantifier free formula of course it's very this is an easy lemma to show 
uh, which is that uh, if a if a is a substructure of b then uh, and v a is any valuation then of course uh, the notion of uh, so the values of terms are preserved under that valuation uh, and of course uh, when we are talking about a term a sigma term t uh, and a quantifier free formula uh, if it can have a valuation in a means that anyway all the variables uh, get values only from a and they do not all the variables in t get values only from a they do not get values from b minus a right uh, so what happens is that so the values are preserved and truth values are also preserved of quantifier free formulae yeah okay uh, the reason for looking at quantifier free formulae is to look at the bodies first and then look at certain classes of formulae so if if I, if you look at our group theoretic axioms if i if i if i take the complete set of group theoretic axioms then they have and I, if i include this instead of that uh, right inverse axiom then all the axioms are consist of a sequence of universal quantifiers followed by a quantifier free formula right? they have the structure. So, the axioms of any algebraic <laughs> system are likely to be of that kind yeah. So, if so the 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 that particular formula phi uh, right inverse was it was the only formula which had a mix of quantifiers. But if you take uh, phi identity and uh, phi um, associativity and you take this then all three of them which actually define group uh, the, the theory of groups first order theory of groups they all have formulas which are essentially universal formulas right and uh, so for any signature sigma the set for, so we can talk about universal formulas and existential formulas right I mean and mixtures of them. So, here is a so you take any quantifier free formula and you take any combinations of and and or uh, the important thing here is uh, I am not including negations ok. I am not including negations because negations introduced arbitrarily uh, so they, they could be negations inside each of these chi's may be. So, negations occur inside already they have already been pushed inside. So, that the negations do not appear outside and I am taking uh, I am taking maybe ands and ors as many as I want and then I am closing with some quantifiers. So, I am closing with the same quantifier q may be in each case. So, a q formula is so you have a universal formula will have a sequence of universal quantifiers and an existential formula will have a sequence of existential <laughs> quantifiers. In the case of the group theoretic axioms we essentially have un universal formulae which define the group theoretic axioms yeah. So, you have the set of universal formulae uh, or uh, uh, an existential formulae which are sub languages of uh, the language of first order logic yeah. Okay. So, the substructure lemma essentially says that if A is a substructure of B and uh, phi is some formula, uh, notice that uh, a universal formula could still have free variables. I mean I may not have quantified over all the variables that occur free in phi. So, it could I might have quantified over some of them only. So, if phi is a universal formula uh, with free variables x 1 to x n then for any valuations v a v b and any values a 1 to a n belonging to the uh, belonging to the domain of a of this of the smaller of putatively the smaller structure a if b for all those values satisfies phi then a would also satisfy. So, what we are essentially saying is that 
properties of substructures can be preserved in a positive fashion. So, the notion of uh, so so anyway, this is this is something that you can prove straight by induction on the structure of this uh, universal formula. So that is not a serious issue. Uh, but uh, the importance of this substructure lemma essentially says that uh, the algebraic notion of a subgroup of a group is preserved right so 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 all the properties of the group restricted to values from the subgroup are preserved in the subgroup. You take a lattice, you take a sub lattice, so a lattice is also an algebraic system with uh, least upper bounds, greater, greatest lower bounds, top and bottom element and so on and so forth. You take a sub lattice and if you restrict your properties to, f to, the, to the truth value of a statement which uses only values from that sub lattice and it is true in the larger structure, then it is also true in the smaller structure. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, this is of course, uh, notice that this is, this is not an if and only if, it is one way. Okay. So, these are, uh, so what we have got today are essentially formalizations uh, for uh, things like um, uh, subgroups, sub lattices, sub monoids yeah? and uh, for uh, 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 so that uh, we are not completely, so, so that we can actually move between within the same signature we can move between uh, in some ways in certain cases in one direction from superstructures to substructures. And in certain other cases, like in the case of isomorphisms, we can move both ways between structures and superstructures. Yeah, right. Uh, so these are some formalizations that are required, uh, essential. They are necessary evils before we uh, come up to the more interesting aspects of uh, first-order logic reasoning. Yeah. So I don't think I have anything more today. Yeah. So I'll I'll stop here today and uh, we will actually look at uh, expressibility of uh, first order we will look at uh, we will look at formalizations of various theories uh, the theory of equivalences may be a theory of uh, we have already formalized the theory of groups we can think of other other structures which you can formalize yeah mm -hmm.